our fourth and final uh, webinar. And uh, first up um, are Dr. Aaron Keith and Dr. Krista Keeley. Um, and I just uh, read uh, a short clip uh, of their bio. So Dr. Aaron Keith is uh, assistant professor at St. Francis University. Um, her teaching and research focuses on inclusion, EDI, ADB, literacy related to inclusive education and mental health, uh, culturally responsive and relevant pedagogies, including engaging families and caregivers as partners and supporting students through str uh, strengths-based lens. Um, Erin uses a decolonizing practice in a praxis, sorry, in her research methodologies and pedagogies, and has been inspired and guided by many Indigenous, Black, and, and racialized scholars. She obtained her doctorate in education from Western University, uh, her master's in education from State University at, of New York uh, at Buffalo, and her BA from Queen's University. Um, she has uh, a co-edited book out on reframing mental health in schools using case studies to promote global dialogue and um, a new ma manuscript um, is in progress. Um, looking forward to this one. It's called Decolonizing Inclusive Education, Centering Heart Work, Care and Listening. And Dr. Krista Keeley is, uh, Keely, sorry, is a former high school teacher and currently working as a training and design specialist at Southeast College in Saskatchewan. Her research and work includes supporting educators in their transition of practice from a factory modeled education framework to a 21st century modeled education framework. Much of her work revolves around the difficult work of decolonization, incorporation of inclusive educational practices, AI and ed tech in education, teaching sustainability and teacher well-being, and 21st century pedagogies. Krista was awarded her doctorate in educational leadership at Western University, her master's degree in education at Queen's, and her uh, bachelor of education at the U of Regina. So please join me in welcoming um, our Nick, our two speakers. Miigwech. Thank you, Dr. Kote Meek, and uh, thank you to uh, everyone in attendance in this community here today. I uh, I have an opportunity to um, be in partnership with my amazing colleague, uh, Krista, to share with you chapter nine uh, within this um, uh, transformative text that uh, we're excited to share a little glimpse of uh, the work that we've been doing um, within our context. So just as the slides load, um, I have an opportunity to share with you a little bit about my background. I'm an Ontario certified teacher. I've been teaching uh, um, within the Brampton uh, Peel region for uh, over 16 years. And um, although I have uh, recently um, uh, left that job within the last couple of years, um, the work of reconciliatory pedagogies is something that um, I've been putting a lot of uh, thought and action behind. So to be able to co-author this chapter and uh, speak about it here today is really quite a gift. So thank you all for being here. So as I begin, um, I'd like to share with you a little bit uh, about our chapter. Um, as I mentioned, it's uh, chapter nine uh, entitled Reconciliatory Pedagogies, Embodying Our Walk as Settler Teachers in Canadian High Schools. Uh, we really are quite honoured to be two settler uh, ally, to be authors, to be included in Sheila and, and um, Taima's book. And and um, to give us the opportunity to share our stories across provinces. So myself coming from Ontario and uh, Krista from uh, Saskatchewan. We invite you to access the QR code uh, and that will take you to a direct link to our uh, chapter. So uh, my name, Dr. Erin Keith. Uh, thank you, Sheila, for uh, that warm welcome and introduction. Uh, my contact information here, of course, for you, available through email as well as social media. And uh, I'm excited to uh, grow and, and uh, grow our network, but also um, connect with you on our talk here today. 
And my name is Dr. Krista Keeley. Um, I have just uh, ended my teaching career and moving into a new role at uh, Southeast College. And I'm really excited to use some of these, um, incorporate these pedagogies into um, a new a new space, a new area, um, and uh, sort of see how um, how uh, broad that we can, you know, create, um, you know, these pedagogies and and connect them to lots of different. Uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, roles. Um, as a white settler and ally to be on Treaty 4 land, the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation, it is my responsibility to support all children, families, and communities impacted by the seemingly unending horrors of residential schools and the ongoing generational trauma of colonization. And I am truly committed to listening, learning, and walking the path toward decolonization, knowing my journey begins in a place of white privilege and ignorance. I will continue to travel this path, honoring intersectionality, equity, and the process of unlearning with humility, respect, and love. For myself as a settler and ally to be, I truly am blessed to live, work, thrive, and raise my family on Treaty Land 18, territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in beautiful Bell Fountain, Ontario. The images that you'll see throughout this slideshow are really intentionally placed. Many of the photos come from Krista and I, um, and the thought behind and the meaning of them we're hoping will open up as we continue through our discussion here today. I acknowledge the territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee's peoples in honor of the eclipse uh, today to think about um, some of the spiritual guidance from um, local peoples around the eclipse and its meaningfulness in terms of renewal and peace. Um, I really just feel privileged as a guest on these lands. And through our talk, through uh, acknowledging the responsibility that we have um, through this reconciliatory work. Um, it's very collective, it's relational, and uh, the idea of decolonizing education is something that Chris and I have both been thinking a lot about over these last few years as educators and as we move forward in connections with um, uh, Indigenous community scholars and yourselves here today. I pay my respects to all first inhabitants across Turtle Island, and we're just truly grateful to be here in community with you. So we begin our journey inspired by Dr. Marie Batiste's teachings. This quote that we've included within our chapter, every school is either a site of rep reproduction or a site of change, has really guided our thought around how we can put reconciliatory uh, pedagogies into praxis within our classrooms. Since the Truth and Reconciliation's 2015 report and its 94 calls to action, there are many calls that intersect education and teacher practice, specifically how to support Indigenous students, their holistic growth, their flourishing, their academic, te their academic achievements. And as settler teachers, we re uh, recognize that this is work this is our responsibility to enact these pedagogies and to call in other settler teachers who may feel paralyzed, who may feel that they're appropriating, that they feel that the work is uh, heavy for where they are in their current journey. Kristen and I both believe that regardless of the weight, cultivating Indigenous pedagogies as settlers, it is possible to grow our work and it was important for us to think about multiple access points into how we can support not only the work that we're doing for our Indigenous students, but also how to partner with colleagues, other settler teachers within our uh, context. The guiding understanding of Indigenous pedagogies comes from so many uh, knowledge keepers, elders, scholars, such as Drs. Kote Meek and Luke Peckering. Pickering, excuse me, as well as many others um, we, we call from uh, Dr. Maggie Kovach, Dr. Ann Lopez, Dr. Lee Mat Patel, among numerous others. 
to think about how Indigenous pedagogies can be centered in the work that we do. We offer you um, today a discussion around what Indigenous pedagogies means to us. And we've used some work from PAP, who's done a lot of um, research with settler teachers in Saskatchewan context, to think about the actions of work that we can do with our students and the perspectives, the uh, uh, epistemologies that um, really ground our practice. And that is of holism, relationality, experiential opportunities, being community focused, ritual centered, ceremonial, spiritual, and interdependent. And so within our chapter, we describe an enduring praxis, a praxis that will continue long um, through our careers and hopefully touch upon um, how we can build uh, the knowing, being, and doing of our work. Although not all settler teachers are confident in this work, we wanted to create um, a framework in which we could invite our colleagues in with the guidance of the many Indigenous scholars that I mentioned. So in order to sort of understand where we're going, we need to understand where we're coming from. Um, Eurocentric pedagogies, they tend to promote independence, compliance, competition and discipline. Um, and this is because the schooling model was created to support an industrial workforce and mold students into the perfect British Canadian citizens. Schools as we typically know them were modeled and fashioned after factories with superintendents, strict hierarchical structures, um, intense supervision, firm divisions of labor, and schools were um, treated education as training and the students as products. Um, specific skills were necessary such as uh, punctuality, compliance, discipline, competition, independence. Um, and these skills were needed in factories um, the teachers were the center of the classroom, the ones in charge, they really were and some and are the factory bosses. So I'd just like you to sort of take a moment to consider the stark contrast between these two pedagogies. While our public school systems have made strides, many of these values and practices still persist today. The structures of schools have not fundamentally changed, many of the values are the same, and teacher-centered learning environments are still prevalent. My question for you is, is this model of education based on ind industrialism and Eurocentric pedagogies working for our students? Next slide. And the reality is no, it, they're not. Um, in Canada, we are consistently seeing Indigenous students graduation rates 30% um, lower than their non-Indigenous classmates. And in Canada, tragically, incarceration rates are about eight times higher. While this is absolutely a failure, a systemic failure with the justice system and obvious racism, it also begs the question, are we ensuring our students are a site of change or are we simply reproducing the harmful practices of the past? So for Krista and I, we have combined over 30 years of teaching experience across K to 12. And we realize that we've contributed to the harm of colonial practices in education. But it's through our own vulnerability and wish to simply do better, we have begun our unlearning journey and strive to recalibrate ourselves. In 2024, educational spaces and places need to be disrupted. They need to be reckoned with so that our Indigenous students can flourish with their innate, innate capacities, gifts, and strengths, spaces where they are amplified to see themselves in all elements of the school and community. As settler teachers, this work is ours. It's time to struggle. It's time to be uncomfortable, practice humility, learn, unlearn, and as Dr. Lee Patel suggests, to be answerable to Batiste's call for change. Uh, in the past uh, year or so, I have been so lucky to work with some incredible students and Poppy Panay is one of those incredible students. Um, her words have guided us through this entire journey um, and we are just so grateful that she has chosen to to give us her, you know, her thoughts and ideas 
on how settler teachers can do better and do that work. And so I'll just briefly read Poppy's, uh, Poppy's words. As an Indigenous student, reconciliation is crucial for me in the classroom. When a teacher attempts to indigenize the classroom setting, it feels liberating. Because we feel embraced in the class, we can be our real selves. Since we are not frightened of being criticized, we can learn more deeply. My advice to white teachers is to evaluate themselves to see whether they have any bias against Indigenous peoples. Consider your actions and ideas regarding our people and whether there's a reason for your thinking. Learn about our people, culture, and traumas so you can better understand your Indigenous students. This is my favorite part. Teachers do not have to be experts. Even knowing that teachers actually care about Indigenous peoples and issues and are working towards learning makes me feel as though we belong. So the imagery of Poppy you'll see guided throughout this slideshow. And again, that intentionality behind the trust and the relationships that Krista has built with Poppy through uh, being her teacher, as well as her contribution in our chapter uh, has been something that um, really has been an inspiration. We also acknowledge our role as allies to be. Um, to become an ally needs to be thought about from an Indigenous community perspective. And this is work that we strive to become. We strive to become allies. We understand that this is um, uh, going to take some time. We understand that trust with the communities within the context um, will need to be worked towards. And we, um, we really um, acknowledge um, uh, Sheila and Tima's uh, quote here about the long-standing concerted effort to build trust and relationships um, that are truly recon reconciliatory. We also are very conscious of the privilege that we have as settler teachers and that we need to walk with humility and we need to listen more. Just like Poppy said, the work needs to be done and uh, it gives us hope, it gives us opportunity but we do recognize that we don't know what's best for Indigenous peoples. And we must make space for decolonization and rightfully center Indigenous peoples' voices as communities reclaim, revitalize their rich cultures, languages, histories, and stories. But how do we do that as settler teachers? How do we help support our colleagues who may be settler teachers through this journey? That was the birth of the work that we're doing within this chapter. We looked at uh, Dr. Poitra Pratt and Danny Lux's um, work out of um, Alberta. Uh, Poitra Pratt is a Métis scholar and uh, together they created um, a cyclical approach to reconciliation specifically geared to settler teachers that asks settlers to listen to, work with and walk with always learning from Indigenous communities and knowledge keepers and elders. We really appreciated the, um, uh, the thought of cyclical process and the acknowledgement that teachers need to have uh, a paradigm in which they can enter based off of where they are in their journey. So uh, this notion of emergence um, and entry into the circle where it fits you as a settler teacher was something that we really resonated with. In addition, we uh, looked at um, uh, uh, Kirkness and Barnhart's for ours work. Krista and I both have really strong affinities for uh, system transformation. Um, we're really looking at ways of, you know, fracturing colonial ways of tradition and legacy and education. And we are always have been guided by the four R's of respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility. Uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, John Poole, John Paul Restoul's uh, additional R of relationship, we saw through the approaches um, that uh, Poitra Pratt talked about that relationships are fundamental. And we really wanted to highlight, highlight that through the five R's process. You'll notice that the paradigms um, are um, um, synergistic, that they really 
uh, give an opportunity for us to uh, cultivate and um, uh, and tend and, and become very conscious of the efforts that we do with settler teachers with the hope to build, foster, sustain, and learn from one another. So using those two um, um, as inspiration, Christian and I developed what we've termed the interwoven living framework. And so the image that you see on the slide really outlines the work that we're hoping that other settler teachers will join us on, this enduring process, this an enduring journey. There are multiple entry points for settler teachers. As we know that a tree is a living, growing um, uh, contribution to the community. The work of reconciliation requires nourishment. And those are those actions that we're attempting, that we're trying, that Poppy asks us to do within our work. And we're going to talk more about what some of those actions are in just a few slides. Those actions are inspired by the five R's. So how are we developing relationships? Is it relevant pedagogies? How are we looking at um, making connections with communities? How are we honoring the students and the Indigenous community members? within our work. So as, um, as, an, as, a, as an entry point, um, settler teachers have an opportunity to listen to uh, their Indigenous students. They have an opportunity to listen to communities, knowledge keepers, and elders. The clouds that you see at the top with the gusty winds really represent sort of the unease, maybe that initial discomfort maybe that uh, growing anticipation of the work that needs to be done. Throughout the body of the tree, you'll notice the working with, and it's those actions that we called upon that, are, that we've been mentioning. Those actions start to bud within the tree through the work of the five R's. You'll see as the leaves grow uh, in size, the work and effort uh, alongside our Indigenous members. And then the walking with through the path at the bottom recognizes that it may be a bumpy journey where mistakes may be made, that biases that need to be checked and uh, can potentially surface. But it's part of the journey that we're on. The grasses that you see there are nourishing, they're healing, and they hopefully invigorate the work that we're doing in partnership as well. So this interwoven living framework, this image is one that has really become a beacon for us in the work that we're doing. And we'd like to share a few of the stories of those actions, the reconciliatory actions um, that have budded as a result of Poitras Pratt, Kirkness Barnhart, Ristool's five R's. So let's talk a little bit about some of the paths. As you listen to the stories, think about which R is associated with the action. We'll begin with listening to and learning from. So here we um, we have thought a lot about how how did we get started? How can teachers get started when when they are up? in those clouds and and feeling like you know they you don't know where to start um we looked at when we are listening to and learning from we're learning what are those five r's what do they mean what do they mean to you what do they mean to your context how can you embody those listening to knowledge keepers and elders um, from learning from Indigenous communities about histories and stories and culture and art. And, and this can be a baby step towards this work. This can be uh, switching out a uh, the, your radio station to listen to Indigenous music, your local Indigenous music. Uh, this could be listening to a podcast or reading a book that incorporates Indigenous cultures and really making small changes in your life to start to understand and and uh, feel the, the, the experience of Indigenous cultures. 
walking with and learning from, this is where you are starting to become that ally to be. You are standing alongside Indigenous uh, communities. You're acknowledging where you need to grow and you need to learn and you need to unlearn. You're showing up. This could be standing next to Indigenous colleagues, students, communities in protest, in celebration. Um, this could look like embedding these Indigenous pedagogies into your teaching and building meaningful relationships with Indigenous communities. One small, tiny thing that I have done um, in the walking with is to really focus on building meaningful uh, relationships with not only the Indigenous students in my spaces, but also the Indigenous students across uh, all spaces within my school by simply opening my door and inviting people in for conversation, for community, for storytelling. Um, and that has really, it seems like a very small thing, but that has really transformed the way that um, students relate to me and I relate to students. Um, and the gifts that these students bring to me is immeasurable. And finally, the working with, being intentional when selecting resources, um, supporting students to see themselves reflected in their learning, making, making your work relevant, making it relevant to the, the students' lives, understanding what it means to live in their shoes and walk in their shoes, um, to recognize that what you are asking these students to do is not always going to be their biggest priority and to honor that and respect that and to work with them. Um, to make mistakes, this is something that we can't get away from. We will and have made mistakes, but it's about making those, being brave enough to make those mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. Um, also working with um, Indigenous communities by doing the work. Um, if, you, if you are not close enough to feel the, um, to feel the wrath, you are not standing close enough to uh, Indigenous communities. So you are standing next to, you are helping, you are helping plan events and learning opportunities while continuing to learn. And like Aaron said, this is not linear. This is cyclical. We are always moving from one to another and back and forth, depending on where we're at in our journeys, people we meet, and new learnings and unlearnings that we have. So the chapter outlines uh, tremendous more examples um, yes. through that um, through that framework. Um, we hope that the interwoven living framework inspires you along your journeys of reconciliation and that Poppy's wisdom about teachers not having to be experts, even knowing that teachers care about Indigenous peoples and her words and the issues are working towards learning makes me feel as though we belong. And that really is what's keeping us going. I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to share a little bit about our chapter here today. Thank you to my amazing colleague, Krista, Chimigwech, thank you, to Sheila, Tima, and all of you here in attendance today. Huge shout out to uh, Brock University's Center for Pedagogical Innovation as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Well, thanks very much, uh, Aaron and Krista. Um, that was a really great um, synopsis, kind of, of your of your chapter. And thank you for uh, your work and your efforts around, uh, you know, building reconciliatory practices, but also um, your work in being an ally. So, miigwech for that.
We're going to move uh, directly on to the next uh, presentation, and then once um, the next presentation is done, we'll have time for a bit of a Q&A. So we have two uh, presenters, um, and I'll uh, introduce them. Uh, the first one is Dr. Robin Rowe. And Robin is a First Nations uh, woman with mixed settler ancestry. She's a member of the Matachawan First Nation and a hereditary uh, member of the Temiagama Anishinaabe in northeastern Ontario. She holds a master's in Indigenous relations and a PhD in interdisciplinary rural and northern health and is currently doing a postdoc fellow at Queen's University in Indigenous digital rights, decolonization and data in artificial intelligence. She owes a great deal of gratitude to many Indigenous peoples from uh, and nations from across the province and around the world who have contributed to her success in academia and research. Um, her research expertise includes a deep understanding of the historical and ongoing experiences of First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples in Canada, and not notably she is recognized for her knowledge and skills that support community-led efforts to integrating and activating Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous data governance. So welcome Robin. And the next up is uh, Dr. Amy Shawanda, uh, who's a proud Adawakwe from Wakwimakong Unceded Territory on Manitoulin Island. Dr. Shawanda is an assistant professor in Indigenous Health at McGill, McGill University's Department of Fa Family Medicine. Um, her primary research interest is in physical health, sleep, nutrition and exercise, family and community health, uh, the Indigenous commercial in the Indigenous Commercial Determinants of Health <laughs> and Policy Work. Um, she is community-driven, generationally inspired, and social justice-oriented. And honestly, you know, um, I used to work at Laurentian University where both of these uh, young women went, went to school for a period of time, and it's been an amazing uh, journey watching them um, move into these roles that they're in now. So, and both of them, you know, recently completed their PhDs and are doing just like fabulous work. So, it's just a really special um, welcome to both of you. Miigwech. Miigwech. So, I am going to share a PowerPoint if you let me. So I'm assuming everybody can see the main screen. I can no longer see the chat or your wonderful faces, but I do want to say miigwech to everybody for joining us today. And it's so nice to see you, Amy. Amy and I, um, we go way back as, uh, as Sheila is mentioning, we were at Laurentian together for a very long time. And so writing this chapter together was really like a climactic moment in both of our careers, I think. And now Amy's um, at a university, which is really cool uh, to see that she's, you know, in her in her role as a professor. And um, and this chapter writing sort of happened all at the same time as as she was getting herself situated and I was getting myself situated. It's just really wonderful to be able to work together in these various forms. So. Our presentation um, is going to feel and look slightly different from the presentation that uh, that you just experienced, which was lovely, Miigwech, for sharing all of that. Um, in that, you know, we're going to leave a little bit a little bit of room, I think, for for you to go and read the book and read the chapter. So chapter 10 um, is Indigenous Pedagogies and the Implications of EdTech Data and AI in the Classroom. And so I'm going to sort of bounce around a little bit here. Uh, I was really fortunate. I had a student um, support me in building this PowerPoint presentation. And so it may or may not be in the order I would have typically have organized it. Um, however, I didn't want to play with it too hard because she worked really hard on it. So she even organized it in like different directions and stuff. So for our east direction, um, 
we're going to just, you know, introduce the work, maybe situate ourselves a little bit more, talk about why we wrote the chapter and the reasons that it is uh, the direction that we took, and just talk about how um, all of these different pieces come together. So, what is the why behind this presentation? As you know, we're here because we really want to, you know, support uh, Sheila and Taima in advancing these conversations and everybody who's working in this space and really just make sure that we are empowering future generations in all these different spectrums. And so the nature and essence of this chapter really revolves around initially is, is born of this idea that as educational technologies continue to grow and emerge, what is lacking is a true understanding of Indigenous worldviews within that. So we're kind of just moving along without really um, taking into consideration what the possible impacts are sociologically, economically, um, even, even ecologically uh, in terms of the, the you know, Mother Earth impact of these um, of these technologies. And so uh, EdTech, if you're unfamiliar, is education technologies. It's the practice of introducing information and communication technology tools into the classroom to create more engaging, inclusive, and individualized learning experiences, according to Daily 2022. Now, in the chapter, we talk a little bit more about this, but just to sort of take a moment to reflect on mine and Amy's roles. So it was really our work and our roles as mothers that originally connected us. So we united in our shared experiences as university students and as Anishinaabe women. Um, and then we had together, both of us, the, the added responsibility of raising children and pursuing higher education in an institution that really wasn't designed with our specific experiences and realities in mind. And I mean, Amy and I, you know, doing a PhD wasn't hard enough. Both of us actually also, um, had a child amidst our PhDs on top of already doing our education um, with children. So it's uh, it's been really incredible to have somebody sort of in my corner, somebody who understands the challenges of navigating these spaces. And it's really important. And what ended up happening was with um, COVID, we found ourselves having a lot of sort of virtual conversations talking about um, the challenges from our, our you know, various perspectives and experiences, but at the same time with our academic lens and our mother lens and I coming from a space of Indigenous data governance, specifically thinking about data and how these new, um, the technologies, the boom in technology because of COVID really, you know, I was worried about my kids. I had some situations with my, with my kids that just never would have happened if it hadn't been for them having to be online doing education and talking to Amy about these same things and her coming in with her really deep and profound um, methodological perspectives. And so it just really worked out that this opportunity sort of, you know, put, was put in front of our paths and um, that we were able to come together and do this work. And so Chimi Gwech, um, and in terms of sort of where I'm coming from today, so myself, I am situated on the traditional territories of the Wanapate First Nation, um, which is just outside of Sudbury, part of Sudbury in Hanmer, which is uh, Sudbury itself is the Atikamikshang Anishinaabek um, territories. But my family lives on Bear Island, um, which is in Tamagni. And uh, that's, as as Sheila mentioned, two and a half hours from here is the traditional territories of my family. And so um, it's really just really great to be here. And Amy, I'd like to give you some a chance to jump in. Um, my assumption is you can all see me. And so you'll see Amy when she speaks, but I can stop sharing if needed. Ani, thank you, Robin, for that. Um, yeah, it's been quite the journey and also through our journey of looking at ed tech and AI, it was such a it was such a profound moment where we were coming together, sharing stories of the positive impacts and the negative impacts that we were seeing um, hitting our community and also listening to community in that process where they talked about the dangers of using AI and getting um, overly invested in it. So that was some of the things that we were we were having these really great conversations. Um, 
about. And then also, I am I am situated in Montreal in the traditional territories of the Mohawks um, of Ganawage and Ganasadage. Um, but currently, presently, I'm situated on Treaty Six uh, with the Cree and the Black Blackfeet and all of these wonderful nations that are currently hosting me in Edmonton at this time. So I just wanted to acknowledge the space that I'm currently in. So Chimigach, I'll pass it back to you, Robin. You wish. So when thinking about it was it was actually it was such a dive diving into this conversation because um, personally I had never spent a whole lot of time attempting to understand pedagogy in that language in that word um, it was always methodology it was a way of thinking or a way of knowing or a way of being that sort of embraced my understanding of what a pedagogy was. So really taking the time to understand pedagogies and different pedagogies and going and even reading some um, like really old pedagogical approaches like mainstream pedagogy worldviews and trying to understand all of these different spaces. It was a really, um, it was an exciting time, I think, you know, pulling all of this together. And so we approached this chapter with the perspective of, we don't want to tell people what to do. We don't want you to walk out of the into this chapter and assume that we are saying this is the way it needs to be, but more here are some options, some ways to think about things as you navigate educational technologies and data, the data world and all of the potential harms that can come of that, while at the same time thinking about artificial intelligence and the move forward. So we have sort of this, you know, backwards in the moments and forward sort of consideration of um, how to think about these things. And so we come to this um, realizing that as we move into these spaces and as they continue to become um, more commonplace, you know, some my my kids have opportunities, even while they're in class now, um, to have some of their classes available online, or, you know, their math homework is now done online, even though they are sitting in a classroom. And um, so our understandings must consider the role of ongoing colonial agendas and be embedded within decolonial knowledges because for indigenous people, uh, we can no longer pretend that it is in our best interest to get on board with the project of modernity and economic developments as a pathway to self-determination. And um, so that's, that's a quote pulled directly from the chapter. Essentially what we're trying to do is expand on current lack of um, not just protection but of acknowledgement of realization of the role of ed tech from an indigenous perspective from our perspectives and and we um, developed some ways to do that so as we pulled everything together we really thought about again the past and the present and um it's really important for Indigenous peoples to reflect on both the present and past influences of colonization to effectively showcase their resilience. So this is across everything, whether it's educational technology, education in the classroom, um, you know, if it's healthcare, both of us have um, roles in, in healthcare research and social sciences. Regardless, understanding today requires us to recognize the role of the past and how the role of the past continues to impact the present. So in this chapter we really do um, try to make sure that there's some of that base understanding to ensure that as you're making your way through the chapter even though there are other chapters which explain it in much more depth but that you know we we point to some of the major challenges the truth and reconciliation the reasons for um, the united nations declaration on the rights of indigenous people and what that how that it reasserts things that we already know as indigenous peoples and our rights and um but just recognizing that it's important to um, braid that in to all of the work that we do as part of an Indigenous pedagogy, as part of decolonizing the way we, we currently think. And that's something we also talk about in this chapter is really recognizing that it's not just about decolonizing the classroom or decolonizing educational technologies. It's really about recognizing and decolonizing our minds um, so that 
it it feels natural you know you wake up in the morning you brush your teeth that's just a regular normal thing you know it's not something it becomes habit you breathe you don't you don't think that you're breathing you're just doing the thing um and that's what it means to really be sitting with and decolonizing your mind is that it becomes so natural and you would you naturally um you live that pedagogy you live in that way and so this is um again our attempt to really strengthen that understanding for people and understanding how to um, apply that when you're thinking through oh what, what kind of educational technology should i employ in the classroom and what benefits or what negatives could come of these things So um, again, this is really just backgrounds. So we really want to encourage readers to recognize the significance of decolonization within ed tech systems for our children and for ourselves um, and ensure that there is an awareness of self-determination in educational uh, technology systems and awareness of indigenous worldviews and encourage readers to really think about the things that they're using and the potential, you know, all the different areas really think critically about the uses of educational technologies and what they could mean. And so some of the things in the chapter that we touch on is stuff like uh, the uses of big data and artificial intelligence. And um, we point to some of the environmental impacts that can come from using these technologies. And, you know, we, we direct you to really dig into these things and really ensure that you have a fulsome perspective. And to do so, um, I just want to jump straight to, okay, so one of the, I'm going to speak to what uh, we dubbed the EdTech trickster, and then I'm going to let Amy touch on the uh, next section, which is where we applied in an Indigenous pedagogy. We, we took the seven grandfather teachings and added considerations to the seven grandfather teachings in relation to ed educational technologies. But on the front end in the chapter, which is it's described in much more detail in the chapter, and I actually I think it's really um, like it's kind of interesting to think about the idea of um, Nana Bojo, the trickster. And so Indigenous nations often, you know, they construct these um, metaphors of the trickster. And I mean, when I was when I was a kid, um, they my, I had a stepdad that would say things like, oh, no, you can't go outside at this time or don't be whistling outside at this time because, um, you know, there's the tricksters out there and you don't want the trickster to to hear you whistling or um, he would refer to Matt Damon, but he was saying Mad Demon and I didn't understand. Um, not the same thing as a trickster by any means, but the trickster could get you to go and see Matt Damon was his, he was, he was funny. Um, anyways, so while Indigenous nations construct tricksters in their own ways, there are some cross-cultural similarities often considered cultural heroes. Trickster, tricksters are credited uh, with protects protecting and in some cases creating human life. As their name suggests, however, tricksters are also associated with rule breaking. They're curious pranksters who frequently cross and challenge boundaries as well as ignore uh, social harmony and order. For generations, trickster stories have been used to entertain community members as well as to transmit traditional knowledge about society, culture, and morality. And so in the chapter, what we speak about is um, the tricksters' adventures and misadventures as something that's meant to teach uh, right from wrong and how to live a good life. And so on the one hand, the ed tech trickster is accessible, user friendly and convenient. The ed tech trickster is fun and keeps its users engaged in learning while collecting, combining and de-identifying pieces of its users information, all while getting to know them better under the guise of getting to know them better, right? So the ed tech trickster then takes 
those pieces of user data and through AI automated processes, it can generate personalized learning and tutoring opportunities, simplify grading, individualize market strategies, and keep users interested in line with its users' real life aspirations and more. So you've got these, this dichotomy, this, you know, there's this really positive thing that can come from this, but also there's this other, you know, other place that you're like, well, do I like this? So on the one hand, the ed tech trickster lacks effective policies, regulation, and oversight. In fact, computers can correctly re-identify virtually any person from an anonymized data set using just a few random pieces of anonymized information, making the risk of re-identification uh, a typical component of the ed tech trickster. The ed tech trickster is disconnected from community and culture as PENAC 2018 enforces, tricksters get into trouble when disconnected from traditional teachings, family, community, nation, culture, and land. The ed tech trickster overlooks the complex relationship between indigenous peoples, the land, cultures, and technology. The ed tech trickster inadequately engages or builds relationships with its users and fails to uphold genuine indigenous knowledges and pedagogies. It roots itself in capitalism and sells its users' data for a price. It's biased in its views, tricking users into believing only the realities that it wants users to believe while ignoring ongoing systemic and colonial truths. In its gathering and automating of user data, the EdTech trickster inc increases a user's risk to privacy violations and of becoming targets of data and AI generated marketing, misinformation, algorithmic profiling, and more, the harms of which inequitably impact structurally marginalized groups more than others. So now we're going to, I believe, jump into um, some of the seven grandfather teachings. And so, Amy, would you like to chat about this? Uh, sure. So change slide whenever you need. OK, um, thank you, Robin. And thank you for that um, intro for this particular when we were going through this chapter, we were thinking about like the methodology because we were when we were having conversations, we we're pulling in real life time of what was happening in terms of the, the greatness. Like right now, we're all here on Zoom because of EdTech capabilities we're able to share with you. I'm able to come to you from Edmonton and all our respective um, places together today. And so that is the benefit of using EdTech and other AI platforms. They're, they've just simplified life for us so much easier. And as I'm working with students, a lot of them want to rely on AI, which is like a great tool. I often caution them, like if you're going to use it, you're going to have to cite it. If you're going to use it, you're going to have to get ethics approval. If you're going to use it, make sure you know the pros and cons of it. Because if you're um, not talking to community, you got to let them know right from the beginning. And that comes into these seven grandfathers right from the get-go. It's like, well, how are you conducting yourselves within working with students, working with community? So I'm always just trying to pull in those teachings wherever I can and really think about it from this um, point of view. Uh, change the side, please. Or do I change it? OK, <laughs> the teaching of wisdom. So we actually use Benton Benet, who um, talks about he, we pulled it from the Michelle Mist book and we really wanted to get down to the root of it because as Anishinaabek, we have diverse teachings on what those seven grandfather teachings are. And I've been cautioned out of um, not only from my family um, and my elders and my knowledge holders that, you know, I don't overly publish a lot of sacred ceremonial or our knowledge out there, I'll, I'll rely on what's already been said. And if I need to build upon it, upon it, I will. But one of the things that um, the teaching of wisdom is like using that, it is user friendly, it's it's simple. We're, we have access to knowledge at the tip of our fingers. We can access so much really great information. And you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. So you gotta be able to have those analytical and those critical thinking skills to be able to assess. And so that's some of the work that I teach my students is, you know, looking at like, yeah, that's a really great tool, but is it factual? Like, is that something um, with the, what all the literature is saying together and really building upon that? Because like, you can find anything if you wanna go down the rabbit hole of misinformation you'll find all that misinformation and if you want to find the other things on um 
based science and um, experiences, you can also find that. So you, which rabbit hole do you want to go down to <laughs> is something that I always think about when when using this, but also like using ed tech in, in the classroom. I see it with my with my own children when they were working with it and there is benefits to it. Um, like even just recently, I had seen this wonderful um, people reading stories to children. I'm like, that's such a great way if if parents are not actively reading i'm like well there's even youtube of people doing it i mean it, it, there's so many benefits to reading your your um to your child in person but also like if you're just crunched for time i was just like whoa that's really neat for parents that need to access that anyways you can move on to the next slide uh the teaching of love to know love is to know peace and this is where we were really thinking about future generations past and present um and how we put these uh, systems ahead. So one of the things I teach my students and really thinking about uh, methodologies and ethics is I, I often come to, I just recently had this conversation with a colleague at McGill and we were talking about a knife. A knife can be a useful tool. It could be a helpful tool. It can benefit you in so many ways. Um, or you can use a knife and harm people with it and not use it in good in good ways. So it's up to you as the user to figure out in which way you want to use the knife. So in this case, we're talking about AI, ed tech, and so that we can talk about in which ways do we want to use it in a good way that benefits all. So that's where we were coming from is like looking at this perspective of love. And so bringing in that knife analogy, we were just really thinking about, you know, we can, we can use the skin um, rabbits, we can use it to create things. It's just, it's all at your fingertips, but the user needs to know the ethics behind it. So that's just coming from a place of love. Next slide, please. To honor all of creation is to have respect. Some of the things um, I had gotten this teaching from um, Edna Manitowabi. And so she was part of my PhD research um, who sat on my, as a community member. And she really talked about, you know, being against initially about um, technology and because of all of the all of the mining of resources that go into it creating these spaces for us to go in so that was something I was thinking about and often I pose this question to, to my own students is like looking at what makes your computer a computer and functional and how does that bring so we're, we're bringing in all these iPads and you got to update them or they break or they crack or whatnot and so like what what impact is that having on environment when we discard of these things or how can we reuse and recycle these things if if possible so those were some of the things I was thinking when we were, we were talking about this realm of ed tech next slide please uh, bravery is to face the foe with integrity, um, accountability in their learning journey. And that was something we were really thinking about is how we're using this accountability. Again, it comes back down to the ethical use of it and how students were wanting to, or even teachers using it. There's so many great benefits to um, using it in a way that is going to serve multiple generations. And so thinking about it in a more complex way of how is this something that can be built upon better? Because we're we're always constantly improving platforms, software, but also an accountability. I I was this also kind of came in with if Robin when we were talking about our stories, and I had learned about um, uh, students' work being uploaded into uh, a particular AI software, and so we were we were talking about the ethics behind that and how you. Yes, they're benefit beneficial, but where does it get stored? How does it get stored and used beyond that? And so we're like, who has access to that beyond? Does it go in through an AI generation? Is it just like being repeated and now spitting out this and other AI platforms? So these were just conversations we were having. So also to be mindful when using those platforms. Next slide. Honesty is facing the situation to be brave. So we were looking at that. Um, what honesty looks like and culturally appropriate and safe approaches. So again, coming from my own experience working with students, I had students that were wanting to upload and analyze data from 
meth for for research and i was like hold on we can't be doing that i was like did you get community permission to did you have it in your ethics form did you have it in your consent forms because if you're not doing that you're breaching ethics so that was i was like you need to be honest yes it's a shortcut for you but you're also missing out on those critical skills you got to know how to uh be able to analyze the data that you and aggregate it when you're going through that because yes you you can upload it but it's not necessarily the best way to get work done so um when we were sitting in some um uh what are they called proposals mm -hmm. and so those were often my questions for students it's like hey wait a minute you said you're using ai software what software are you using because those are critical points because is it being stored in the us is it being stored in canada is it being stored on your computer like where is this information those are those are we need to be transparent with communities and if you're not doing that that's not being honest with them so i think that this was an important um part that we added and humility is to know yourself as sacred part of creation um indigenous sacred pathways and knowledge highlighting the importance of maintaining a balance between western and indigenous uh, perspectives. And so I think this is what a really great um, area that we're starting to see a lot of people take on AI in that collaboration with First Nations people um, coming together, being part of that accountability, working together so that we can create, co-create even. I know there's so much great work happening in AI. Um, there's people creating virtual wor worlds and that they're producing technology, um, but they're also aware of the environmental impacts. Like there's so much great work going on. Indigenous people are really innovative and embracing technology. And we're so happy to see that it's it's in survivance of our culture, our languages, and our, our just ways of doing things. So I think that embracing is really great, but also we just have to uh, caution on, on using it or being over-reliant on it. And truth is to know all these things. So acknowledging the seven grandfathers in ed tech systems, um, I think like looking at it from a both, we weren't approaching it like Robin had said, we're not looking at you can't do this and you should do this. And it wasn't like that. It was just to look at it a full scope of the pros and cons of using ed tech. There's something about we we're just talking about books last night and reading books and there's just something about holding it feeling it smelling it it can bring back the memories of what you've read and memory retentions whereas when you're online you're not as as interactive with your materials so that was just something we were we were talking about and thinking about in the full scope of things i'll pass it to you rob in case you wanted to add no i think that sounds good in terms of truth as well i think one of the um one of the consideration is also ensuring that um, that we really are as indigenous people, as non-indigenous people, as the people who hold the level of knowledge that may actually supersede our capacity. This is if you know if indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, Inuit in Canada make up less than five percent of the entire country. So you can imagine that those of us who are actually working in either education or any of these the sectors any of the main sectors that our uh, our capacity is usually not in a space where you get to sit down and read a book on something educational um, because everything is so fast and so the people who actually work in spaces where um, artificial intelligence and the environmental impacts and things like that are being taken into consideration that that truth conversation is being had um, and and given the appropriate amount of space and time and energy so that decisions moving forward are informed with the realities of the situation and i think that that's something that is often missing in many of the decisions that we make it's that we're just like almost in you know response we're just in that response mode and we're failing to remember like truth comes before reconciliation we can't respond we can't do something we can't do the thing until we actually understand the whole picture of the thing and i think when we when we pulled together the the seven grandfathers what we were really trying to do is offer that sort of um interdisciplinary multi-layered critical reflection of don't forget to think about all these different spaces. And so um, miigwech, Amy, for, for all of that. And so um, as we get to the end here, um, this, yeah, inspiration, a pathway towards reframing our thinking. So what is this all about is really to inspire, educate, and encourage. 
Um, and I think, you know, we've we've said that in various ways now. But ultimately, we hope that you take some time to sit in with this chapter and with all of the chapters in this book, because what it really does is it, it gives you that opportunity to just think differently about. And I think that's that's um, whether it's about educational technology or teaching or, you know, other spaces around um, around education and what that looks like and how to um, ensure that it's relational and reciprocal and you know that you're embedding the five r's like as were shared in the previous uh, presentation and that any work that you do that sort of comes out of this space avoids what um, in our chapter we refer to uh, maggie walter's work which are the five d's and those speak of um research and work that are born that are based in deficits and deprivation and disadvantage dysfunction and difference and sort of encourage that push towards the five r's as opposed to this sort of space where you know we look at things like um the rates of education and the lack of attainment of and you know how can we use education technologies in a way that's meaningful and that encourages um higher educational attainment for our people while at the same time ensuring that we're not putting them at a disadvantage where now we've created a monotonous group of people who can use artificial intelligence like pros but can't think for themselves and we make some fun references to things like you know growing up being told you have to learn math because you're never going to be walking around with a calculator in your pocket and what happens in that situation and now we all walk around with calculators in our pocket attached to our cell phones and so recognizing that if if it weren't for um having a cell phone in your pocket i mean if there was a power outage we've got this eclipse happening there's some there's some conspiracies going around you know stock up on your toilet paper and things like that and if there was a power outage, could people do basic math? Could people do um, the the things that, you know, we need uh, to, to sort of sustain this world that we live in? And I think making sure that we don't further disadvantage, uh, particularly, you know, people in northern rural communities who don't have access to educational opportunities. You know, my community, um, once you hit grade nine, you have to leave. You have to leave the community, and um, and that's a that's a really big challenge. That there's a lot of issues that come from it. I've had family who've been in really awful situations because they aren't at home and they're 13 years old, living in a different city away from their family. Um, and, you know, because we don't have the same types of access and advantage that people in major cities or in regular, you know, normal cities have um, when you live in more rural and remote locations, that we do make consideration for, okay, how can ed tech support these communities, but also don't make it be the thing that um, supersedes, you know, the need for infrastructure, perhaps, um, and that sort of thing. And that at the end of the day, our kids still walk out of there with critical thinking skills, which a lot of children, I have four of them, so I feel like I can speak a little bit on behalf of my four, um, in that they, the critical thinking has, has it's been losing. The critical thinking now has turned into, yes, but if they know how to find the answer, that's what we consider critical thinking. Oh, okay, so if they know how to do the Google search, then that's their, and so, you know, considering just some of those things um, and really, really being mindful of things like um, Indigenous data sovereignty, Indigenous data governance, or more specifically, First Nations data governance, Métis data governance, Inuit data governance, structures, support, infrastructure, all of those spaces that are relevant to our people to ensure that the data that's being collected from these is not going to turn around and bite us later. Um, but yes, so that is all I have for presentation at this moment. I'm going to stop sharing. Miigwech so much. Um, Amy, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, you summarized uh, it 